Well, Canyon and the Mechanical Marvel, the final installment in the Pokemon movie series at the time of this video, and also the finale to my Pokemon movie marathon. It's taken me two years to get to this point, but I am very glad that I was able to make it to the end. And I'm also very thankful to all of you for the support and criticism you have given me throughout the course of this marathon. So to repay you, here is my review of all Canyon and the Mechanical Marvel. So our film begins with an airship shop for our Gen 6 legendary of this film, Volcanion, shows up and attacks. So why is he attacking? an airship? Well, it's because that airship contains his friend, Megarna, who is stuck in a container. Held up, isn't Megarna on Gen 7 Pokemon? Yep, much like the Zoroark and Lucario movies, this film is meant to advertise the next generation, in this case, Generation 7. Sweet! I can't wait for her big character arc like Lucario's movie. Yeah! Character arc. So back in the airship, our two pilots send out their Pokemon to combat Volcanion, and we get introduced to a new concept for this film series, the Mega Wave, which is basically forced Mega Evolutions. Volcanion fights the two Megas for a bit before one of the pilots attaches a band around one of Volcanion's legs and proceeds to freeze Volcanion before launching it off the ship. Well, that guy's dead. Nope! Despite being frozen and despite falling from thousands of feet, Volcanion crashes into the Hyogenous group of rat and is perfectly fine. Huh. Well, in that case, this guy could survive anything. Oh, and Ash gets hit by one of the bands, which basically forces Ash and Volcanion to be near each other at all times. Otherwise, the Magnus and the band will force them to crash into each other. Great. Oh, and don't worry if you didn't laugh the first time Ash collided with Volcanion. They only do it like a gajillion more times, so you'll have plenty more chances to laugh. Speaking of the band, it also somehow has the ability to expand because Ash is able to change clothes without any difficulty. I mean, that has to be the explanation. Otherwise, this makes no freaking sense. So what's Volcanion's? reaction to meeting Ash's group? He doesn't like humans. I know, what a new concept for these movies. But hey, maybe his reason is different. So what is his reason for hating humans? Because in the area he protects, which is the Nebel Plateau, all the Pokemon there were harmed by humans and now fear them. Okay. That's actually a pretty good reason. Especially since I've shown with the anime, there are a lot of cases where humans either abandon or abuse Pokemon. So, good job, movie. You did something different with this concept. Speaking of concepts, though, we then cut to the Azoth Kingdom, which is basically a steampunk kingdom, where our two pilots from the prologue are delivering Megana to our antagonist for this film, Alba. Oh, and there's also this prince, but his importance to this film is so big that it can't be mentioned in a single story synopsis. It's sarcasm is still shit. And so is this character. Anyways, we got an explanation of what Megana is. Basically, it's an artificial Pokemon created by a scientist by the name of Nicola 500 years ago before Volcanion, unfortunately, yeah, show up to try to rescue Megana. Megarna, and Volcanion succeeds. Volcanion bitches about humans again, because the movie thinks we forgot he hates them, and Ash's group introduces himself to Megarna for a bit, but while that's going on, Alva recruits Team Rocket to help him get Megarna back. Later on, Ash and his group make their way to the Neville Plateau, but are ambushed by Team Rocket possessing Mega Wave bracelets and a Heracross and Pinsir. But that basically goes about as well as you expect. Volcanion basically nukes the two bugs with a steam explosion. Oh, and the princess, who's actually named Kimia, shows up to deal with Team Rocket. That was a thing. So why is she helping Ash? group? Well, it's because she doesn't trust Alva and believes he has an ulterior motive to his plan of getting Megarna. You mean the guy who forces Pokemon to Mega Evolve against their will and looks suspicious might have an ulterior motive? Thanks, Kimia! I never would have realized that if it wasn't for your superb observation skills! So after that scene, Ash's group arrives at the plateau and with the help of a gulpin, finally destroys the two bracelets connecting Ash and Volcanion. Thank you. God. But Volcanion gets pissy with humans. Again. Yes, movie. We get it. He hates humans. You made that clear three times now. Stop repeating yourself. Thankfully, however, Alva, who's probably sick of that as much as me, shows up after this scene and attacks the plateau, dropping a lot of Pokemon, including Volcanion, in the process. So what does Megarna do? Surrenders. Yeah, makes sense, especially since if she didn't, a lot of Pokemon would have gotten hurt. But hey, maybe she'll break free of her restraints and lead Church to protect the plateau later in the movie. Or you could have Alva remove her core, leaving her useless house for pretty much the rest of the movie. Yeah, movie, that was clearly the better option. But wait! It gets stupider! Why did Alva want the core? So that he could take over the kingdom. So, let me get this straight. This man, right here, who has 14 Pokemon, all of which he can mega evolve at one second that staff, wants the core of Megarna to take over the kingdom. Why not just use your Megas to take over the kingdom, you stupid fuck? That's like having control of all the nukes in the world, but you want to steal the blueprints of the original Atom Box so that you can use that to destroy all resistance. What the fuck? Well, here's why. Because without that core and or the relationship with Volcanion, Megarna has nothing else to it. You see, folks, Megarna barely has a character in this movie. 
It doesn't speak, which by the way makes no sense since it was made by humans. It barely emotes or shows any feelings. The only role Megarna has in this movie is not the role of a character, but the role of a plot device. And even then that's a stretch because its role is basically to serve as a fucking battery. Joyous! Hell, it's not even a character and plot device like with Manaphy. Megarna is just a plot device with barely a character to its name. Hell, despite the fact that it's supposed to promote the seventh generation, Volcanion has more of a character in this movie than Megarna ever does. You know, the Gen 6 Pokemon, and yet this film still expects me to care about my Garna dying when the core is removed. Sorry, movie, but this isn't Latios or Lucario or hell, even Zoroark since she nearly died. You want me to feel something for this character potentially dying? Make me care about them as characters and not as just plot devices. So Volcanion tells us the story of how he met Magarna, and all we really find out about Magarna here is that the two became friends basically because Magarna was able to protect itself when Volcanion exploded. Over with Alva, he inserts Magarna's core into a mechanism inside the kingdom, and out pops the flying fortress with the cannon. So for the climax, Ash's group and Kimia invade the fortress, and we get a big action scene where Ash's friends and Bonnie Zygarde named Squishy take on the 14 Mega Evolutions. And unlike the last movie, I actually like this big ass battle scene. All our characters are in the area, including the non-main characters, so there is a bit attention and suspense there, there's actual consequences in the form of Megarna's core not getting free if they lose, and everyone gets to participate. Even Squishy activates his 10% form. Ash and Volcanion then make it to Alva's location, but he restrains them, so Alva fires a big shot at the plateau, and this causes Megarna, who still has a conscious somehow, to shut down after seeing its home destroyed. So Alva fires a big shot at the plateau again, but this time, the Pokemon defend it, but it's not enough. So Squishy absorbs all the Zygarde cores and reaches its complete form. Hell yeah! So what does it do? Blocks the attack and then Nemorphs. That, that's it. He could have attacked the base or destroyed the cannon, but uh, no. He just blocks one shot. <sighs> So Volcanion dispels the traps, Ash destroys the Mega Wave and frees Megarna's core, but Alva sends the fortress on a collision course to the plateau before escaping the fortress, or rather try to escape the fortress since Ash Ninja destroys his jetpack. Oh, and despite putting the core back in, Megarna lost its memory and personality, or lack thereof, but I already bitched about that earlier, so let's just end this. Volcanion destroys the fortress with steam explosion after Ash's group retreats, and everyone thinks it's dead, even though it survived a long drop already and was also frozen. In. And surprise, surprise, it's alive. Magarna then regains her memories and minimal personality, and all is good. The end. Roll credits. So as a story, it's actually really good. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't know back my laughter there. This story sucks. Sure, it does have some decent bits, like Volcanion's reason for hating humans and the battle scene in the climax, but unfortunately, it's weighed down by a shitty plot device, weak chemistry between the other characters, with the sole exception of Volcanion and Garnet's chemistry, and terrible writing. Again, for the first half of the movie, they hammer in Volcanion's hatred of humans ad nauseum when they really didn't need to. They could have easily established that hatred, explain why later, and then get the development. Hell, the fact that it was repeated so many times would kind of imply the Volcanion really despises humans to the point of not changing his mind, and yet as the film goes on, he drops that hatred in no time flat. What the fuck? Now, yes, Ash and his group did attempt to show that they care for Pokemon in front of Volcanion, but again, given how many times he repeated his lines about eating humans, it sounds like he isn't going to change his mind ever, and yet he does in no time flat. What the hell, movie? On top of that, the magnetic bracelets felt really worthless to the overall film. Given these movies, it's very likely Ashton's group would have followed the canyon anyways, so why even make these things? Hell, it never pops up again outside of the credits when it's used on Alva, so again! What was the point of these things? I already bitched about how stupid it was to make Magarna just a plot device, so I won't repeat it here, but as for Alva's plan, I will repeat it here. His plan is goddamn idiotic! You have a goddamn army of mega evolutions at your disposal, yet you want a useless goddamn core to take over the kingdom? That is freaking dumb! But then again, that would give Alva a motive to do the things he does, and as I will later explain in the character section, giving this guy more of a character seemed to be low on the writer's list of priorities. Then again, I could say the same thing for the prince, but again, I will get to that later. So yeah, as a story, it really was not that good. As for the characters, this was also handled poorly. But before I bitch about that, let me get the positives out of the way. Despite my issues with the dialogue and no writing at points, Volcanion was a good character. And before I remember the Volcanion survived a long drop already, I was legit concerned he was gonna die when he used that explosion on the castle. If a character can make me feel something like that when they are quote-unquote about to die, then I think the writers did a good job with this character. Oh, and he's voiced by Mike Pollock. 
Nice. I also like that Ashton's group got to contribute in the climax, and despite the writing at points, I did like the Team Rocket had something to do this time around instead of being wasted for the umpteenth time in these movies. Hell, Kimia herself was also decently written, but that's where the positives end. The rest of the characters are shit. Magarna is shit, the two pilots from the beginning of the film are flat as a doorknob, Riley the prince had so much potential as a character, but it was wasted after Alva put him to sleep for pretty much the rest of the movie, severing any real chance for character development aside from one small scene near the end and the credit scene. On top of that, I didn't really like his chemistry with Alva all that much. It came off as a little flat in my opinion, and they could have done a lot more with it, but again, they decided to knock him out for pretty much the rest of the movie, so I guess the chemistry between the two wasn't really all that important to the writers. Speaking of Alva, this is one of the worst villains I have seen in a while for these movies. Not only does his plan make no sense, but he is so bland! Seriously, all this character is going for him outside of his chemistry with the prince, and even then that was flat, is his mega wave concept and his plan. He has no real personality, no backstory, no real motive aside from controlling the kingdom, hell he's not even threatening! There's nothing here for me to like about this character outside of the concept and plan, and even then his plan is problematic! so I can't even love to hate this villain! Christ! Going back to the specials for a minute, at least Giovanni from both Origins and Returns had a decently written personality and threat level, and Pokemon Origins gave him a decent backstory. Hell, even Mirage Master had a decent reason to do the things he does. This guy is so bad, it makes the Mirage Master look like a good villain in comparison, and I hated his ass in Mastermind Mirage Pokemon. They could have easily made him a good antagonist, especially since the last few antagonists have been pretty weak sauce. But they didn't, and this film suffers because of that. Thankfully, however, the animation and music make up for this film's various shortcomings. The animation for this film looks really good, the highlight being the big action scene near the end. I love the character models in this one, the effects and coloring are pretty good too, and I absolutely love the design of the kingdom. Sure, it's not seen that often in the film, but the use of Steamwork technology and design really helps this stand out from cities and kingdoms seen in previous installments, so good job animators. And as for the soundtrack, while it's not as great as previous films, it's still pretty good to listen to, especially with the ending piece Soul Heart. I friggin' love that song, even if it is mainly about that plot device of a character. The lyrics, the tempo, the choice of instruments, I just love it. You know, it's actually kind of funny. Even with the mediocre and or bad Pokemon films I reviewed throughout this marathon, I've still found most of their ending pieces to be pretty good. Genesect and the Legend Awakened, Pokemon Razor and the Temple of the Sea, Zorax movie. I guess what I'm saying is, even if a Pokemon film is really bad, there's still something positive about it. No matter how big or small it is. It's kind of sad though, I didn't realize that back when I made that list. But now I'm getting sentimental, so let's end this. Overall, Volcanion and the Mechanical Marvel is... A pretty bad movie. Well, the animation and music do help this film a bit. The story is bad, the characters are mediocre at best, the writing is bad, and the villain absolutely sucked. So what I classify this as the best of the Kalos trilogy, I really don't know. Because really, I didn't like any of these movies in the trilogy. Which is a damn shame, because the Kalos anime was really damn good. It had a heart, it had characters developing, it had great battles and stories to tell. It made Team Flare look like a threat to me when it came to that arc. Hell, it even made me like Ash more as a character. In fact, you know what? I would honestly recommend watching the Kalos anime over these three movies. Yeah, it takes longer, but I feel that it honestly has better writing, characters, and music, well, depending on the version you're watching, of course, than these three movies ever had. Though, speaking of movies, the next installment is set to be a retelling of the anime's very first season. Only time will tell if that film will be good, but after watching Origins, I have a little bit more hope that this one will do well. And hey, if it does, that might give the company making these films a push in the right direction to make these films great again. But for now, it's time for me to move on to finer pastures. I cannot thank you all enough for the support and critique you've given me over the last two years. I really appreciate it. As for what's coming up next, I have plans to review other anime and or cartoons on this channel, including Soul Eater, Ruby Volume 4, and to celebrate the 30th anniversary of this series, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. I will also review the 20th movie when that comes out in English, but that's for later down the line. Oh, right. What about the rankings? You know, from 19 to 1? Oh, don't worry, Toucher. I put them in a very special place. But in order to get to that place, I need to end the video. So until we meet again, I'm David Grimm, and thank you for watching.